on camera. Today is March 14th, 2016. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the Atlanta History Center. And with me is Tony Hilliard, who is also a volunteer with the Atlanta History Center, and Sue Verhoff, who is a senior archivist at the History Center. Uh, we're very honored today to be with Mr. Robert E. McCann, who is a veteran of World War II. And we we're going to be talking to Mr. McCann about his experiences, both just in life in general and particularly during, his, during World War II. And this is part of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. And Mr. McCann, we're really honored to be with you today, and we appreciate you letting us come into your home mm -hmm. to talk to you. Very good. <laughs> Would you give us your full name and your date of birth? Uh, Robert E. McCann, which is Eugene McCann, and I'm senior. I have a son that's, that's a junior. And uh, the name was used three times, so <laughs> got confusing. Born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I actually enlisted from a small place called Wilkinsburg, which is a suburb of, of Pittsburgh. And I was uh, born in Homopathic Hospital in Pittsburgh on January 3rd, 1926. Okay. Mm -hmm. And where do you currently live? What city and what state? I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and, uh, well, actually, Sandy Springs. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Uh, well, I was brought up, of course, uh, I experienced the Depression when I was very young, and uh, I can remember that uh, during the Depression, my dad had a very good job with the uh, power company in Pittsburgh. He lost his job, and my wife, not my wife, but my mother was a registered nurse, and she lost her job. She ended up selling shirts door to door to try to make ends meet. And uh, my dad eventually did get a job selling butter, eggs, and cheese in a little town. But I can remember as a child, the only milk that we had was what the schools provided through the United States government. And uh, I can remember of, uh, of doing without a lot. Uh, I remember of my dad putting cardboard in my shoes because I had holes in them. I couldn't afford to buy yeah. shoes, so uh -huh. he would provide that protection from the weather, although it didn't do any good. <laughs> you still got wet feet. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I was saying a while ago, we just don't appreciate what we have nowadays. It was really, it was really sad, but it, and later it made me appreciate the things that I did get, so. Tell the story you mentioned before we started about food. Oh uh, yeah. When, when we were growing up during the Depression when they put food on our plates, and, and it was nutrition. I'm sure that my mother would insist we'd eat all our vegetables, but we had to eat everything on our plate regardless of whether we liked it or not. Yeah. But it's not true today. We, just, we have such waste of food today. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. true. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about where you went to school. I went to school, uh, very fortunate, in uh, grade school in Wilkinsburg, and uh, I've told people this and they couldn't believe it, is back then when I went to school, in grade school, teachers in Pennsylvania were not allowed to be married. Now isn't that unusual? I don't think many people knew about that, but a lot of them would get married, of course they wouldn't, wouldn't tell it, they lied about it really. <laughs> Isn't that something? And that then uh, I went from there to uh, the high school there. But then that's when uh, the war came, and uh, that's when I, we moved south to uh, a place called Gadsden, Alabama. Okay. And uh, uh, we heard about uh, Hitler and all of that. That was in 1939 that we heard about uh, Hitler. When you were hearing about Hitler in 1939, did, did you have any idea we would end up in a war like World War II? I had no idea, you know, it was just an inkling of, of uh, 
unrest in in the world. Uh -huh. yeah. I do remember going to New York World's Fair in 1939. So let's see, I was only uh, uh, 13 years old, uh, six, yeah, 13 uh, years old, I guess. Talk yeah. about your observations at the World Fair as a 13-year-old. Oh, it was fantastic uh, just to see New York City. And I can remember my dad trying to find a place to park. And uh, a policeman came by. He pulled into a place where he thought he could park. And the policeman said, N he just so, he said, you can't park there. This, this is reserved, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had to go find another place to park. But the sphere and the, the, the ball and the sphere were. And I found out years later that it's still there. Uh, they made a park out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I assume you drove up from Alabama? To New York? Yes, yes, up. we drove up from uh, Pennsylvania, I think. Up. No, let's see, from Alabama, Alabama. yeah. Yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. yeah. That must have been quite an experience. It really was. I, um, my dad was in construction and engineering, and uh, that's when we went south. We traveled a lot during the war for that reason. Uh -huh. He was on military bases and so forth to do construction work. Oh, okay. And uh, it was quite an experience just moving south, period, yeah. it was, <laughs> after being up north for so long. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the day you heard that uh, Pearl Harbor had been attacked and what uh, your feeling was. Well, we was. heard it on the radio, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I've probably seen pictures of people watching uh, the radio back then you didn't have TV and yeah. uh, and you just couldn't believe what was coming along that you know, in that radio broadcast and uh, it was scary uh, uh, you just had regrets that it was happening you didn't realize what all would be involved yeah. mm -hmm. what was the reaction of people around you were they were they scared or were they excited or did they just sort of think it was something that wouldn't affect us? Or? Yeah, I think some of them were excited and uh, uh, unsure, yeah. I guess, what you know, would happen. So you were, what, 15 or 16 years old at this time? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, I knew I was going to be drafted. I got the card and I knew that eventually I would be drafted. Yeah. And uh, I had an uncle that told me, yeah, he said, you know, rather than be drafted, you need to, to enlist in the Navy because at least you'd have a good dry place. You wouldn't have a foxhole to sleep in <laughs> and you'd have a cold drink of water. I'll never forget that cold drink of really? water. And that's exactly what you got in the Navy. Mm. So I joined the Navy and, uh, at 17. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I had to have permission from my parents. Uh, my dad was all right with it, but my mother put yeah. up a little bit of a battle. But she realized I was going to go into service anyhow, so yeah. she okayed. I'm so glad she did because uh, when I went through uh, to go into the service, there was a line going through by the desk, and the man sitting there would say, uh, Army, Navy, or Marine Corps. And the fellow in front of me said, well, I like the Coast Guard, and he'd say Army. <laughs> and then they came to me, and they pushed my paperwork because I was already said Navy. He didn't say anything. He just stamped it Navy. But I heard him say to the man behind me, Army, Mar Navy, or Marine Corps? And he said, well, I, I'd like the, the Marines. He said, Army. So <laughs> everybody that went yeah. in that day went into the Army. And I often think later, all those that went to the Army probably ended up in the invasion of Europe. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, mm. so uh, after that, I uh, went to boot camp, which was up in Great Lakes, Illinois. And uh, that was quite an experience for a 17-year-old <laughs> to grow up. But anyhow, uh, you learn to take orders. and. Uh, from there, I was sent out to amphibious base in, in Coronado Beach, California, which is right near San Diego. Coronado Beach, later I found out, was where they trained uh, 
uh, amphibious uh, in this thing for hunting. Uh, Bin, so uh, Bin Laden, oh. yeah, and uh, huh. the special forces, yeah. and uh, that's where they trained too later. Huh. But <clears throat> there is where we learned to handle Higgins boats, which uh, a Higgins boat is 36 foot long and, and carries a, a uh, about 36 Marines or Army, and it can hold a small Jeep and a small tank, really. and. Uh, it it was powered by a diesel engine, and I had a crew of uh, three, uh, two deckhands and a motor machinist, and I was the coxswain, and uh, it was my responsibility to look after the crew. And uh, it was quite an interesting boat. Uh, it was developed uh, by Higgins, and uh, it had a... A, uh, a ramp in the front that would drop down so that when you beached, it would, you were able to drop that ramp down and the Marines or Army could go out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Had you ever had experience with watercraft before? Never. Never had any experience. Learned all about it there at San Diego. And what they did, they sent you out, and that was a heavy surf there, but it was an ideal beach to practice on because it was it was a shallow beach. And what I found out later <coughs> at Iwo Jima, it was just the opposite. It was a real steep beach, and it was hard to hold that boat on the beach oh. because of it being so steep. So, But the training was good. Mm -hmm. Were you trained at all for a steep beach at any no. point? No. No, it was all easy beach, and yeah. but I remember the the process was to hit the beach, and then you learn how to back the boat off the shore by looking back. But you didn't stare back; you had to watch the bow so the bow didn't swing. Okay. The minute the bow started to swing, if you didn't correct it, it would swing around and do what they call broach. In other words, it would go counter cockwise to the waves coming in oh. and then you'd watch it and just as you got the, the wave came in you would cut the engine so the boat would go through the water or go up over the water and not through it oh. mm -hmm. yeah it's a lot of detail well, that must have been a challenge to learn how to do it that. it really was it really was but i i set my eye on a pole way back on the beach and there was two slots on the ramp and I would watch that pole and try to keep it centered in the middle of that and I could tell whether the bow was swinging or not. Oh. So, uh, and that's how, I guess how I became a coxswain because I w they do a test and I was able to pass that. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. So where did you go after that training? Okay, after that we were sent to Astoria, Oregon where uh, they launched Liberty ships. Okay. And the ship they launched was the USS Napa, APA-157, which is assault personnel. Uh, APA, I don't know what the, amphibious, I guess, was the A, yeah. And after that, um, uh, we were assigned that ship, and then we had to go out it was launched and a new ship, and we had to do what they call uh, shakedown cruises, where they would uh, uh, make sure the ship, ship was operating all right, as far as the engines and everything on board had to, had to pass that uh, shakedown cruise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you were in the training, did they have troops also training in in the Higgins boat, or were you usually driving? No, 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 they didn't have that. It wasn't until later. Okay. Uh, yes. Mr. McCann, when, when, you were, when you joined the ship, were you part of the ship's crew? Uh, not really. We were called amphibious. We were, uh, we were not a part of the crew. Uh, but actually, that, that's not really true because when we weren't taking the responsibility of our boats, we had to chip in and do things. In other words, we had to paint 
and everything. And I'll never forget one of my first assignments was because they found out I was an artist. They did the camouflage on board ship where they, they break up the outline of the ship so it can't be recognized. And uh, since I was able to paint, I was able to go along and paint the straight lines. And then the other guys would come behind me and paint and fill in. So <laughs> that, that was my first experience at art on board ship. Well, you know, one thing we didn't talk about, and then we'll come back to this, but talk a little bit about your training to be an artist. Cause uh, never, it just was a natural it. thing. When I was a boy, I would take a, a notebook with me when we'd go out on Sunday rides and I would draw things that I saw and I drew it from memory. In other words, I had a photographic mind, I could look at something, and that paid off later in my life too when I went to work at Lockheed. Wow. Uh, that ability to be able to, it was just natural uh, wow. for me, and I had a natural uh, ability to do what they call, it's um, uh, perspective drawing. I could do perspective drawing, and. I found out later that not many people have that ability. Mm -hmm. What is that? Is that being able to think of, think uh, of it? The perspective drawing? is uh, there's a line and you have vanishing points and everything vanishes to those points oh. either way. Mm -hmm. huh. But okay. then I didn't know it, but I was, I was doing what, you know, what came naturally. Yeah, and, and after some research, I found out later that I did have somebody in my dad's side that, that uh, was a cartoonist for a paper out in Illinois or somewhere. Gosh. And that's not, wow. so probably running the family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll continue discussing your training and then just your, your military career. Yeah, well, after, uh, after our uh, shakedown cruise and we were assigned to go to Hawaii, and on our way over there, we took uh, the Navy CBs, which is a construction battalion. We took them down to Hawaii, and uh, we were uh, put on the island of Maui. Well, we were on the ship, but we had to go on the beach at Maui and practice uh, landing there. And that was a part of our training for invasion. And I'll never forget one time we were on, on Maui and uh, in the boat, and uh, there was a school of uh, a rainbow fish, and they all landed in the boat. They, oh. They're flying fish, that's yeah. what they were. And they all, a bunch of them came and landed right in the boat. Uh -huh. Wow. It was, uh, it was interesting. I mean, yeah, <laughs> at, I at my age, I was learning <laughs> a lot, you know. Um, from there, um, uh, after training at Maui, uh, we didn't know where we were going, but the, the ship was, um, they told us that uh, it was secret, we, we were going to sea, and of course all the dates and everything, uh, but uh, I remember of uh, going to sea and we didn't know where we were going, and it wasn't until after we were out to sea for quite a ways that they came on and told us we were headed for the invasion of Iwo Jima. And you know that was scary because yeah. we knew what was going on in the in the world and the, the Japanese, how cruel they were, and everything. Now, would this have been late '44? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. See, the invasion was February 19th of '45, okay. and uh, I had just turned 19, I believe. Uh, yeah, January of '45. I just turned 19. Okay. And that's another thing, almost all the men that were on that invasion really were teenagers. Yeah. You know, that's that's really uh, something. Uh, and I think the reason was they're running out of men over in Europe and uh, there's a lot of young people were coming in to serve in the South Pacific. Mm -hmm. And just to be sure we get this on the record, you joined the service on May 17th, 1940. 44. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Attention residents, attention residents. The mail has arrived. The mail has arrived. <laughs> the mail has arrived. Thank you. <laughs> so, 
you now knew that you were going into some pretty heavy action. Yes, yes, you knew mm -hmm. we were all the preparations and everything, and you had to be sure your boat was in order. And incidentally, there's uh, 26 boats on a, on a ship like that, mm -hmm. and uh, 24 of them are the LCVPs, and only two of them are all metal larger uh, boats. And uh, you were trained to use either one, but mine was assigned to boat 23, which was put inside of one of these LCMs, just for for purpose of shipping on board ship, yeah. and uh, so. But they they were uh, they had twin engines, and you were able to maneuver them a lot easier. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, talk about your experiences of the before the invasion and during it after it, what you saw, what you experienced, what your feelings were? Well, the first thing I, we noticed when we came near was the horrendous bombing that was going on. And uh, uh, I read about it later and they, they understand that, uh, that all the bombing that they were doing with these ships and aircraft which wasn't even phasing the Japanese because they were built into the caves and everything and they had they had no way of knowing all about this and and so uh, it was kind of a waste of, of bombing in a sense mm -hmm. it might have softened the Japanese somewhat but it didn't deter them at all yeah. and I remember uh, uh, going under the bow I believe it was the, the St. Louis or the Pennsylvania I don't know it was a battle wagon and seeing the shells that were piled up on deck of how many times they'd been firing at the beach. So they didn't give up, they kept on shelling. Yeah. But the Japanese were buried into those caves. Yeah. And I, I found out later there was a full hospital the Japanese had underground. That's the, the man, that, the commander, the, the admiral they put in charge of that island I believe his name was Karabachi. He he was such a good general that he had built all these caves prior to the invasion. He knew that the Americans were coming. And I found out later that Karabachi graduated from Yale University. Really? And when he was going back at the start of the war, he told them he was leaving. And when he left Yale, the ones that he was in class with donated money and they bought him a pearl handled 45. A lot of people don't know that. Wow. And he had that gun <coughs> when he was killed. He had that gun. Oh, uh -huh. gosh. Yeah. It's a, you That's learned, very interesting. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, you learn so much, don't you? And putting yeah. things together over yeah. the years. Yeah. Wow. But he was a wonderful, <coughs> wonderful leader for the Japanese. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about the invasion. Okay. Uh, uh, the weather was, was good when we first started. But on the third day, the weather turned bad. And uh, to try to la launch or try to put a boat into the shore with a heavy surf is very difficult. And... Uh, so over a period of, of, of days, uh, the beach would be littered with all kinds of tanks, uh, other boats turned over, uh, jeeps, uh, you name it. The beach got so littered with debris that it was hard to find a place to land your boat. You're supposed to land in, in a certain area like, like maybe on Blue Beach but it became impossible to do that. You had to go down the beach to wherever you could find a place to put your boat. And uh, I can remember after, I, I believe it was about five days of hitting the beach, that um, I, I went to go on, on shore at a clear spot, and a hauser got caught in my propeller, which is a rope uh, from debris, got caught in my propeller and I lost control. I didn't have any power on the boat, so there was no way I could back the boat off the beach. So you're, you're trained that 
when that happens or anything like that happens, that you have to go ashore and take your crew because the boat would broach or turn over and they would be caught in that yeah. boat. Yeah. So on the beach, they have what they call a beach master. And the beach master was off of our ship and he uh, was uh, one of the DuPonts. He was, uh, he was a commander huh. in the Navy and he was one of the DuPonts. Gosh. Isn't that something? That, that is. Yeah, and of course we knew about him on board ship. And uh, later I did a cartoon of him. He lost the end of his thumb uh, at Iwo Jima. <laughs> And I made a cartoon of him losing his thumb. <laughs> I don't probably wasn't funny to him, but it was. It was. But anyhow, um, I went ashore and, and, and took my crew with me. And uh, I he asked I, I he told us to go down towards Mount Sarabachi, what was clear down on the end of the island. That would be the south end of the island, and. Uh, to board an LST down there. Uh, incidentally, we didn't have any food for for five days. All we had was sea rations, yeah. which are, are just dog biscuits, really. <laughs> and but we did each each boat was assigned with a case of pears, canned pears, which was really great to have. And uh, so we went down and uh, we went on board the LST that we were supposed to go on and um, as we boarded they wanted to know if we were hungry and we said yeah so they fed us Campbell's chicken noodle soup and you know to this day I love Campbell's <laughs> chicken noodle soup it's fantastic and um, so we couldn't go back uh, to our ship because our ship we had heard uh, had been uh, hit by another ship, oh. and so we we weren't able to go back right away. But in the process of taking in the invasion, we were able to take the Marines in, and then bring the wounded out. And that was a, a very sad part of that experience was to bring the wounded out. Uh, I'll never forget. I had to load a, a captain that lost his leg. And it's things that you never forget. Yeah. You, you know, you hear of this, uh, uh, the stress that you get out of something like that. But I don't know. I it it affected me at the time. But uh, it just you just never get that out of it, uh, your yeah. memory. And uh, then we would take them out to the hospital ships, which the hospital ships were really fantastic. This was a war where they were able to get the wounded off the island and get them medical attention, even though they had corpsmen from the Navy uh, that would take care of them on shore, it was the importance of getting to those ships. Mm -hmm. And it was not only the hospital ships, but you would take them to other ships like ours had, a, had an operation room where they could perform surgeries and so forth there too. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, there were other ships too mm -hmm. that were able to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as the battle was going on, were you going back and forth evacuating? Yes, yes. All the time the battle was going on. And we we were in what they call the first wave. Um, the first wave is, is generally considered the worst. But in the case of Iwo Jima, it really was an advantage because uh, the first wave, the Japanese were waiting until everybody as they could got ashore and then they would open fire. Yeah. So being in the first wave wasn't as bad as we thought it would be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did did you see the flag being waved? I did on the, on the fifth day and all the ships in the harbor uh, blew their whistles and everything else. It was a fantastic day, That's yeah to see that flag go up there. Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, we saw it on the day we were walking down the beach to get on the LST is when we saw the flag raised. Oh, mm -hmm. And there was all that debris on. The, you know, I often wonder what happened, how they cleared all that off the beach. It yeah. was, it, what a waste war is, huh? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. It really is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> When did you leave Iwo Jima? Uh, Not that sort of the day, but yeah, how it was long well nineteenth, about the twenty, about the twenty fourth or twenty fifth, I guess. Okay. And the reason we had to leave, I told you, my our ship was rammed, yeah. and we were told to go to uh, Guam for repairs. Okay. Uh, Another little story, on the way back there, I was uh, up on the bridge with the skipper, and uh, as we watched the USS Franklin, which was an aircraft carrier, was burnt. You had no indications of paint on it anywhere, and the deck was warped like that, the flight deck. And I understand later that there was over a thousand men were killed on the Franklin. But was another interesting thing behind it was, and I believe it was the cruiser St. Paul, that you could see a hole in the side, which was, they have a cover over it, but it was big enough for a trailer truck to go through. And what was so amazing was the damage of the Franklin and the, the St. Paul they were still able to do 21 knots, and that was absolutely amazing to think that enough of that crew was able to get that ship underway, yeah. and they were headed to Guam too. And after we got to Guam, we were able to see the, the Franklin tied up at the dock and get a real close view of how it was damaged. A lot of people, you know, those things that happen you just uh, you just can never get it out of your mind. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. You still yeah. think about it to this day, I'm sure. Yeah. So when we got to Guam, we were put in what they call dry dock. It's a, it's a big dock that uh, they fill it with water and sink it, and then the ships go in, and then they pump, out the, they pump the water out, and it raises the ship up to get it out of the water, and then that's, they're able to work on it. Okay. Incidentally, that was built in the United States, and it was sent over, uh, you know, towed over there to Guam. And uh, on the way over, they lost a section of it in a storm, and they had to go back and build another one. But I was able to see that it's still there when I was there in 2004. Wow. It was still there. Now, that's, that's really amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, did you go back to Iwo Jima after the repairs? Uh, n no, after we repaired, uh, that was another thing. I, I had taken what they call the Eddy test when I went in the Navy, and that's uh, electronics. To, uh, they have a definition for it. Uh, but you take the Eddy test to see if you qualify for radio, uh, um, Morse code, and, and things like that. And I passed that Eddy test, but the school was so full that they, they, I wasn't able to get into class. And they said, well, they put that in my record. And I thought, oh, sure they will, you know, but they did. And they called me out. And, and when we were at Guam, a, a uh, officer called me out and, and asked me, he said, would you like to go to radar training on Guam? And I said, oh, I, I would. And uh, the fellows that I was uh, competing with, they were all what, ready what they call a, apprentice radar operators. They had already had training, and I didn't have a bit of training. I didn't even know really what radar was hardly. And uh, there was two, two uh, classifications given when you went through the school, so I made up my mind. I wanted one of those. So I studied hard. I wanted to get out of the boat group. It, it was rough. It was yeah. rough. Yeah. And uh, so I, I studied harder than the other ones, and I got one of those classifications. And that changed my whole life aboard ship. Mm -hmm. So what happened then? Where, how did it change your life, and where did you go? Well, it was much better to serve. Uh, we were in the communications on the bridge, right where everything was going on, you knew exactly. We were trained in air search, where you track the airplanes in, and 
and to see radar in use, it was really wonderful. Um, and what type of craft were you on? It was still back on the APA. Oh, it's still back on. Okay. We were signed back to the ship. Okay. Yeah, which was nice. Everything was familiar. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, from there, we were. Uh, I remember being in the Philippines uh, when uh, they we were notified to put to, uh, to sea because there was a typhoon coming, and that was Halsey's typhoon. You don't put these things together until later. We were just told it was a typhoon, yeah. and uh, I remember reading that there's a book out called Halsey's typhoon you know he was court-martialed you know and there was a trial and uh, what happened was he was really misinformed about the weather he didn't purposely send his fleet into that typhoon that back then they didn't have the information as far as weather was concerned and so Halsey sent his whole fleet into it and uh, we were in that typhoon and it was five days of nothing but up and down. And you'd see, you'd see the sky, and then you'd see water. And it was all, all day long. You had to, you had to strap yourself in your, your uh, cot because of the, the weather, the ship rolling. And you couldn't eat. It just, it just changed your life for five days. It was uh, up and down like that. Mm -hmm. Were any men injured or lost during that? Uh, not on our ship. Uh, there was a couple hurt, but on I understand there was a battle wagon or an aircraft. I don't remember which it was. Lost the bow. You know when they evidently went up one of those large waves and came back down. It broke the bow right off, and I think there was some men killed yeah. on board that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this. Uh, I don't know whether they record any of this or not, yeah. uh, you know, as far as history is concerned. But, yeah. Uh, but I also, in reading the uh, the book on that Halsey storm, I think there was 800 men were uh, lost on that because what was happening? The, the uh, small DEs or destroyer escorts or DE destroyers uh, would capsize. Oh. And when they would capsize, they of course they'd go right down, and the men would be trapped in there. And where the the problem was, when they took these DEs, which were older, they they when they brought them back to the states, they put heavier armament on them, heavier guns, and what they didn't realize that they were making them top heavy. Oh. And that's why when they got in a typhoon, that once they started to roll, you know. When you're in a ship, you need to head into the wave. And the purpose of that is to go up over the wave and not go through it. Mm. And so if you got caught broadside with the wave and didn't know it, you just yeah. roll right over. Mm. Isn't that something? That is. Yeah. Um, also in the process of that, I was on radar when uh, I picked up what they call a small pip on the screen. And at first we thought it was a Japanese uh, submarine. And I had to report it, and when I reported it, and we tracked it, and it, nothing happened. It didn't move or anything. And what we had to do was we tried to identify it. The skipper tried to identify what it was. It was a, a ship of some kind or a boat, and he couldn't get any action from him. And the storm had pretty well let up by then. So we, the skipper sent a, uh, a small boat with a uh, small crew over to see what was going on. And it was a, an American tub. Uh, it was a, a towing a vessel that evidently came out of one of the, the harbors there, and it was at sea. And uh, they went aboard, and they and there was nobody aboard, but they brought the ship's log back, and the ship's log recorded they were taken on water in this storm, and so the skipper of that tug ordered abandon ship, so they abandoned the ship, and uh, had they stayed on board, they would have been rescued, oh. and I often wonder. 
you know, you wonder, were they ever rescued, you know, yeah. whatever happened to them? And I tried to do a little research to see if I could find out what the tug's number was and maybe, you know, to find out, yeah. but I was never able to never do that. Never able to. Never oh. able to do it. Uh -huh. Gee. Yeah, so, isn't that some experience in that? But wait, yeah. That is the experience. Yeah, yes. it really was. But to be involved with something like that was, uh, and I later made a painting of that too, um, uh, of oh. the tug and uh, oh, really? my ship in the background, I made a painting. I did that from memory. Mm -hmm. Good gosh. Yeah. So the advantage of being able to draw. <laughs> yeah. that, that's an incredible mm -hmm. talent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's see, after that, uh, uh, that was, uh, oh, it wasn't long after that we were sent to uh, the invasion of Okinawa. Okay. And uh, now that was a little different invasion because uh, it was the Army that was involved there, not the Marines, which I thought was unusual, but they had their reasons. And the Army did the invasion there, and all we did was uh, take Army in and uh, supplies. And it was pretty well uh, managed by the Army. Uh, so that's all we did was, uh, I don't remember taking wounded out, we probably did. Yeah. Uh, but Okinawa was so different too is that um, the Japanese were trying all they could uh, with their air power to bomb and they'd come over all hours of the night uh, all all time to keep us awake and tire us out and keep us at our aircraft guns so that we would shoot at them and uh, they were doing the kamikazes and the ship right behind us got a direct hit of the uh, kamikaze. Did you see it? Pardon? Did you witness that? Oh yes, it was right right behind us. Uh huh. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and that's what they did just just to pester us, in other words. But another thing was that you had to wear your helmet because all the aircraft going up, there was shrapnel coming down. Oh all the time too, so. Um, but I understand that was the Japanese last effort, you know, to try to uh, to win by air power. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get hit while you were, not you personally, but uh, the craft that you were on? No, no, didn't get a hit. Uh, I know one time we were coming off of Iwo Jima, one of the, my crewmen said, What's that behind us? And I, I said, that's, that's machine gun fire, and it was following us oh. right along. So we were out running the, and we were out running the bullets. You know, I was, I was telling you another interesting thing uh, before we started. Uh, it was in the process of uh, on board ship. Incidentally, we we traveled equal to five times around the world on that ship. So. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of sailing. But uh, we were assigned to go to Tsingtao, China, and pick up what they called the nationalist troops that were being chased by the communists. Oh. And we picked up these nationalist troops, yeah. loaded them on board, and a lot of them were little kids. They were only 12 or 13 years old carrying guns. You know, that, that just uh, yeah. something you never forget, no. you know, their age, you know. And so we loaded them. As a matter of fact, when, when we went to unload them, they had to climb down those uh, rope ladders yeah. and they would cry. They were so scared they didn't want to climb down those rope ladders. Gosh. Uh, but anyhow, we were able to load them on <coughs> and take them over to Formosa, and now that's Taiwan now. Yeah. But a lot of people never knew about that history oh. either. And that's really how uh, uh, Taiwan was occupied back then. Incidentally, we did bring a lot of Japanese prisoners back to the States too. Well, talk about that. What, yeah. what was that? Um, 
experience. Well, I don't remember where. It was one of the islands, Anawitak, or one of the islands. We had to take uh, Japanese prisoners. The reason I thought about that, I was what they call a, a, a first loader uh, with a microphone, and I had to count the officers that came aboard as well as how many Japanese. And so I called back to the bridge and I, I how do you tell a Japanese <laughs> officer, you know? And they said that by a little pin that they wore on their collar, that was the only way you could tell a Japanese oh, officer. Gosh. Which when you think about it, that really protected their life, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, anyhow, on the way back, um, I remember they put these Japanese prisoners down in number one hold, which is a deep hold, and they'd take the covers off so they could get the sunshine and everything. And I remember looking down, and they would feed them um, uh, rice and uh, uh, fish eyes. <laughs> Rice fish and eyes. fish eyes. Yeah. I guess that must have been their favorite dish. I don't know. I, guess, I hope so. <laughs> Gosh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what was their demeanor like? Were they rowdy or quiet? Oh, no, or? they're real quiet. And I couldn't get over as being a first loader and seeing them come by, and they only came up to hear on me. You know, and all, every one of them was so small. Yeah. And that's what I couldn't get over. You know, I forgot to tell you the story on the invasion of Iwo Jima too. As as we were coming, uh, as I was last lost my boat and we were coming ashore, I saw about three or four Japanese coming down with a white flag, and the Marines were down on the shore there. And uh, what you put together later was Marines never trusted. A surrender because the Japanese were willing to die that was their life they they believed in dying for their country and as they came down with that white flag the Marines took a flamethrower and just wiped them out you know and that you know you never forget something like that and uh, it, it was traumatic but uh, we realize that that's what war is, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gosh. So uh, let's see. After that, after Okinawa, uh, we were sailing back. I remember being the first ship in Yokohama, first American ship in Yokohama after the war. Okay. And one of our boats that went over there and painted the, the name of our ship on the lighthouse. Oh, really? <laughs> Somewhere I have a picture of that. Oh. Isn't that something? Yeah. yeah. Well, where were you when the bombs were dropped? On uh, the yeah, we were actually uh, at the end of Okinawa. Okay. Yeah, we were on our way down. And we felt this was great. Uh, in order to come out of the service, you had to have so many points. You got so many points for being overseas, yeah. and so many points if you were in battle, and so many points on your age or on on the time you were in the service. And you, when you got 21 points, you would be able to come out of the service. Well, a lot of those fellows were over there, and they had their points. But where can you be? Where can you go when you're overseas? Yeah. You had to wait till you got back to the states. So. Um, in that process, and we we were ordered then back to the states, and when we come into Seattle, Washington, I'll never forget. I have pictures of that somewhere too, where all the boats and all the people on shore were waving at us, and oh. it was quite a celebration. Um, as a matter of fact, when we came under the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, too, um, the men that we brought back that were they had served in Europe, and they were sent to the South Pacific, and we brought them back and brought them under the Golden Gate Bridge. And when they did, they all threw their hats in the air, and there was a big celebration in yeah, San Francisco. Boy. So we had two welcomes, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we got to uh, 
uh, Seattle, they were gonna, they got orders to decommission the ship. And, uh, but all, of course, everybody came out of the service and they didn't have a crew to man the ship, so they asked for volunteers to take the ship around to the East Coast. And uh, back then there was, um, there was no uh, airplanes to fly in, commercial airplanes. Yeah. And the train, the trains were on strike at that time. So the only way to get home would be to hitchhike. And uh, so I thought, well, I might as well volunteer to take the ship around because I would have to go to the East Coast anyhow. And so I volunteered to do what they call skeleton crew. And uh, you, uh, you, you would sign on board ship, which were just a very few on board ship. Yeah. And uh, so I, I volunteered to take the ship around, which was a, a real experience because I was able to go through the Panama Canal. Oh. And uh, just to go through the Panama Canal yeah. was an experience too. So we brought the ship around to the East Coast and we came into uh, Norfolk. And we were there a short time when they ordered us up to Baltimore, which was better because I had an uncle that lived in Baltimore and my <laughs> parents drove down from Pittsburgh oh. to Baltimore to my uncle's and they picked me up there and they were able to bring me home, so. That had to be an emotional reunion. Hey, man, it was good. <laughs> Glad to have it all over with, yeah. yeah it, was, it was really something. Did you ever have any contact at all or, or see Japanese civilians during the the battles? I know, I know this was primarily a battle site, but did you have any experience at all observing Japanese civilians? No, no. <coughs> All we did was shoot at them. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And you know, there's something else when I applied from, I lost my hearing, and I think a lot of it was due to, to shells, yeah. shell shock, and shells all the time, and I was a first loader on a, a nine-inch gun on the fan tail of my ship, and also an aircraft, I was assigned. You were assigned that you were able to shoot any gun on that ship. In case there was a crew killed, you had to go and man that particular yeah. gun. So we also had to fire the 40 millimeter anti-aircraft as well as the 90 inch. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I want to be sure that we've got we've got it on your your bio form, but I want to be sure we've got the name of all the craft that you served on. Uh, the only one was the USS Napa. Okay, that was PA-157. Okay. And it was at, named after Napa Valley, California. Oh, I wanted to ask you that. It that's named what it Napa was. Okay. It was uh, the, that's the grape, grape area. Okay. And every time the, sh the skipper would be off the ship and come aboard, as soon as he'd come up the ramp, they would say, Napa, Napa. And that was a meaning that the skipper is coming aboard. Okay. Isn't that something? Yeah. <laughs> Napa, <is>. Napa. <laughs> so you never forget that name. <laughs> yeah, it was neat. So how much longer did you stay in the military after you after your parents? Just as soon as I had my twenty one points, okay. I was out. Yeah. Okay. I was glad to get out, yeah. And uh no another interesting thing, I was in um high school in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, Phillips High School, yeah. and uh, I went to, um, I, I enlisted, of course, and they weren't, I was in my senior year, and they wouldn't give me a diploma, huh. even though I was my senior year, and I joined the Navy during the war, Jeez. they wouldn't give me my diploma, and uh, so what I found out then when I came out of the service, I found out that I lacked American history. That's why they wouldn't give me an diploma. Now, I don't know whether you noticed, but years later, there was a lot of the high schools went back and recognized those that didn't get their diploma, and they automatically issued them their diplomas. Really? So that meant that in order to get a high school diploma, I had to take this history. So one of the uh, 
one of the members there gave me a, he gave me a book on American history. And I, I don't know whether you realize it, but that's all the presidents, all the dates of the wars and everything, the United States. American history was really rough. But I made up my mind I was going to pass that test. And I went home. I got the book on a Friday. And I went home and I studied that whole weekend in order to pass. And I went in on Monday and took the test and I got my diploma. Good. So then I was able to go on to college. Yeah. I went to um, Carnegie Tech in Pittsburgh yeah. with an engineering degree. Okay. And then that's when I got hired um, by Lockheed. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about your life a little bit from the time you got out of college and uh, went to Lockheed, and about your family or just anything you would like to be preserved uh, yeah, well, all, all this video. I remember, I guess, uh, I gave my testimony at my church, and uh, I remember, uh, you wonder why you go through these things, and um, I realized that uh, I was fortunate at the time to be able to come through all that, and I came home, and my best buddy that I, I knew at home asked me to go to church with him one night. And I'll never forget of going there. And I heard an evangelist. And he told me about the death of Jesus Christ. And that's the first time in my life I had heard that. Really? And I went forward to receive Christ as my Savior. And another one of my best buddies came behind me. But he was rededicating his life. But after that, I was able to go to that church and I met in the youth group they had there I that's where I met my my wife wow. for the first time and later we were married in that church and uh, then we were we came back uh, I got my job down here in, in Georgia and uh, we raised five five children four boys and a girl and I do believe that's why my boys are in the ministry yeah because of my devotion to my service yeah. to the Lord. Yeah. So it's not me, it's what the Lord did. It changed you know? your life when you yeah. went to that church. Didn't but I? yeah, but I think that was a wonderful thing to be able to be able to share that, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, other than that, uh, and then my wife died 11 years ago and uh, I had that big house and uh, all of that to take care of. And my daughter has been real helpful. Uh, we looked around for a place and uh, I sold my house and we decide, decided to move here, yeah. so. Well, you had mentioned earlier that she went back to Iwo Jima. Yes. Talk about that. Oh, that was quite an experience, yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> they had a, a, an organization that were putting together trips different places but when I saw that one for Iwo Jima uh, my son that lives in Virginia uh, he decided to go with me and so we went together and it was it was a real experience experience uh, uh, one thing that I remember was that we um, we were at uh, a big hotel in Honolulu and while we were waiting to get assigned to go to Iwo Jima uh, I remember seeing the sunset in Hawaiian Islands. It's beautiful. So we walked across the road and sat at the little park there. And we were sitting there watching the sun go down. And I'll never forget my son said, you know, he said, this is, he said, God has a sense of humor. And I said, what do you mean? He said, here I am without a job and I'm sitting here on the beach in Hawaii, <laughs> watching the sun go down, <laughs> and you never forget something like that, you know. <laughs> well, anyhow, so we decided to go back, and uh, uh, they uh, they had, and I have a picture of, they, it was on World News, they had us lined up, the, they flew us back uh, on the island, and uh, I could never understand it, but uh, it's Japanese owned Iwo, and uh, in order to stay there, you had to surrender your passport to the Japanese. Now, if that wasn't the hardest thing to yeah. do, 
why in the world would you have to? And then I found out later, I think the purpose was, uh, in one of the other times that they were there, somebody went into one of those caves and died. And I think that's probably why the Japanese did that, yeah. to make sure that everyone that came a yeah. ashore, they had their identification. Yeah. You know, it wasn't that they because we were Americans. Right. They just wanted to be sure we were all yeah. accounted for. Yeah. But um, and then they sent Marines from uh, Guam to go with us. They sent a vehicle to take us up to Mount Sarabachi and take us all around the island. But the Japanese were there too, and they had a big band. And uh, I forget, it was probably the 65th anniversary or something like that. And every year they do that to memorize the death of all those Japanese, as well as the Americans, the death of the Americans. Uh, and so uh, in the process of doing that, um, the uh, we were lined up. I remember standing behind a row of chairs. They brought chairs for the older men that were there, and there was one admiral that was there. It was in his 90s, and uh, I was standing behind on the end. And uh, as they went to put the memorial, the flowers on the memorial for the death of those. Uh, I'll never forget, it was General Snowden was the officer that was in charge. And his wife was with him, and she said, you know, really, Karabachi, the Japanese general's grandson is there. He ought to be able to be in this, too. Leave it to a woman. <laughs> <laughs> and so they asked me, since I was on the end, standing up, uh, no, let's see. No, I was later. I was in the chair for some reason or other. I guess my age. <laughs> but anyhow, they asked me to get up and give him my chair, and all the crowd. I'll never forget. The, they all went, "Ooh," you know, like that. And uh, but uh, you know, General wanted it done. So uh, as a serviceman, I got up and yeah. uh, and uh, but he came around and. Uh, he shook his head no, and uh, he bowed before me and shook my hand. Now, isn't that, that something is. to have something like that happen to you? And I said, that was the first time I ever had forgiveness of what the Japanese did because I, I lost four buddies on an LCM that got a direct hit. And that's, uh, that's the first time that I had any forgiveness. And I have told that at some churches around yeah. Atlanta because I think that was a, an experience. And I think God gave it to me for that reason, yeah. to share forgiveness, because that's what it's all about, isn't it? It is. That, yeah. That's a remarkable story that well, that happened. I thought that that just kind of capped it all off, that, that experience. Uh -huh. Wow. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I appreciate your interview. <laughs> and like I said, I, I, I've i done this so much, uh, you know, I have actually have a, what is it they call, they put it on a computer and and project it. Uh, my son up in Virginia did that, and it's all recorded on one of those, too. Somewhere I have it here, but I don't know yeah. where. <laughs> well, that, you've got an amazing story. Well, thank uh, you. Yeah. It's, uh, I first want to give Sue and Tony a chance to ask any questions, and then I will give you one more chance to say anything you want to say about anything. Do y'all have any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you. Is there anything else you would like to say, or just anything no, you'd like to put on the I, I just. Uh, I, I would like to look, or like you to yeah, show yeah. these uh, pictures and explain what they are, because yeah, these are pretty uh, fascinating. Well, I, I had. Uh, a picture here of the painting I did of the invasion of Iwo Jima. Um, I did that from memory. Uh, that's something you never forget. And uh, and I also did another painting of uh, Mount Sarabachi. That's where the flag was raised. And uh, I showed pictures of uh, of the different boats going in. 
uh, to the shore. I did that all from memory. And uh, and one of my grandson was in the invasion of Iraq, oh. and I gave him that painting because he had a, a lot of respect for uh, yeah. the service. So uh, I guess that's pretty much it. I Oh, I, I know what I had was um, photographs of the, um, yeah, I was going to let you all copy these, I guess. This is a, uh, that's uh, on Mount Sarabachi oh. is where they put all the emblems of the men, the people that went back. Had their uh, emblems of the ones they lost there. Yeah, she said it'll be better if you hold it yeah. up by you. What was most interesting too, and what impressed me more than anything else, was going on top of Mount Sarabachi, and up there was a steel cross, and on that cross was hanging all the dog tags of the people that came back, and hung their oh. sons. Their fathers, all their relatives, dog tags Gosh. on that cross. Now, isn't that something? That is. Now, I don't know whether it's still there or not, but that impressed me more than anything else of the whole visit there. Gee, well. mm -hmm. Did you say you went back? What year did you go back? Uh, 2004. Mm -hmm. Wow. And this is a, a not much of a picture, but that's the exact beach where I would land it uh -huh. there. Uh -huh. And this is the same thing. It's, it's just a little better picture of Mount Sarabachi. That's a real good picture, of it? Yeah. We flew over too, and that was good. You could get a, we got a view, and it's a, a volcanic uh, uh, island. Okay. And there's another one near it too that's volcanic. Now this is, um, Oh yeah, this is a, from Mount Sarabachi, and that's uh, uh, where the flag was raised. I was, matter of fact, I think I'm standing right where the flag was raised, looking down on the beach, and my LST that I boarded, I think was about right in here, and my boat landed about right in there. But isn't this neat to have something like it this sure and is. be able to, to bring it back? This was a picture of, of some of the caves, oh. how they dug in. Yeah. And they, uh, you know, the, what they do would be tunnel, if they were bombed out of one place, they would tunnel down to another one. It was, a, uh, it was an unusual war. You know, I couldn't help but think of, you know, during the uh, English and American episodes, how the Indians would hide behind trees. And that's what the Japanese did, yeah, really. Yeah. In a sense, it was a different war. Yeah. In World War One, you know, we get in the battle lines and fight. Oh, yeah. But it was it was a different war. That's just another picture of the, and and uh, this is uh, one of the many caves. Gosh. And there's a picture of a Japanese gun there too. Now you weren't allowed to take anything off the island. The only thing you could take off was sand. And my son and I brought back so much sand. <laughs> and when we came through, um, what were they called? When they questioned you. When Customs. You, yeah. When they came through, they have to probe that sand that you have oh. to make sure there's nothing buried in it. Yeah. And the man at, at, at Customs said, he said, you're not going to believe this. But after 65 years, there's still signs of ordnance in that sand. Really? That's how much that island was bombed, you know, and what was all went on there. Jeez. So that's, oh, and uh, this was just a picture of, of um, our return in 2004. Yeah. And uh, that's the group that went back. I would imagine a lot of those fellows are my same age, you know.
Well, you've got to be so glad that you went back, I'm sure. Oh, I am. I don't know how many times I count my blessings about doing that. And uh, I know my son was real pleased. He's in the ministry now. Yeah. And, and uh, he was so glad he went with me. That's the one that was without a job. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. <laughs> Well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate oh, you coming I in here and telling the story. appreciate the interview. I mean, it's, uh -huh. it, number one, it's a fascinating story, but you're very modest. I mean, you were right in the line of fire mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. And we know a lot of men got uh -huh. killed or injured doing oh, what you were doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I've often heard where the, the, the heroes are the ones that have died. That's right. Those are the heroes. Yeah. And, you know, uh, our ship, uh, they put together uh, what they call an apologue. Oh. And uh, I had a part in putting that together, too. Um, it's real interesting to tell us all about us and some of the cartoons all about us and oh. where we were and all that oh. sort of thing. And I didn't know till later that you could go on a computer and, and get a copy of this on the computer. And I didn't find that out till later. But um, being on staff, they gave us uh, three of these. Oh. And uh, so that's interesting to have. Yeah, that's a wonderful thing to have. And it's called the Napa Log. Oh. And that's exactly what it was, was a, a log of the history of the ship. Uh -huh. Not many things happen like that either. Huh? No, you're right. <laughs> oh, well, I appreciate you all. With the interview, it's been really nice. It's a, I, like I said, unless you share with youth, yeah. how do they know? And you know, when I speak to high school kids particularly, I always tell, and a lot of times it's in the spring, and I always tell them, whatever they do, drive carefully. Because I think that's what made heroes during World War II. The young guys, they had nothing to lose. I'm going to do that, and they did it positive, and that's why they were a lot killed that way, too. Yeah. But when you're young, nothing can happen to me, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So I always caution them when I leave, being in springtime, be careful when they drive, yeah. because that's the way they drive. Yeah. They drive the same way. Yeah. They just, nothing can happen to me, yeah. you know? And they get careless, so that's good advice. Yeah, to give anybody. well, you know, that's what you learn from your experience. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, again, I want to thank you for what you did in the military, and also your life after the military. You yeah. obviously are a man of God. You've got four sons who are who are ministers, so yeah. I know you're proud of that. And you've, yeah. you've lived and are continuing to live a wonderful life. And well, what's amazing was I really wasn't raised that way either. So the Lord had his plan in my life, and I'm so thankful. You well, know. well yeah. you've, mm -hmm. you sure lived up to any expectations he has, I'm sure. Well, so. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you again so much. And, and more than anything, we want to thank you for your service. Yeah, well, okay. Very good. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Okay, you're quite welcome. That was great.